Rebirth, Degenerate Slave Abuses Tyrant Chapter 1, Cold The world has frozen over with the constant snowfall in the last few days, between the heavens and the earth. Everything has turned white. Chen Huang Temple, abandoned for many years, lied. Forgotten by the world on the western outskirts of the capital, the sky stayed gloomy even after the snow on this night, with no moon or stars in sight. A little snowdrift has formed below the steps of the temple's main hall. Packed solid, the snow has completely covered the person who'd been discarded there this morning. The cry of several jackdaws broke the silence in the dead of night. A gust of wind whistled past and snowfall that had ceased momentarily started anew. A lone spirit stood silently next to the snowdrift, beneath which rested his former shell. His last breath ended when the wind started a little while ago, and all the pain he experienced seemed to vanish in a moment. The demons of legend won who would escort him to the underworld never came. The spirit couldn't leave his body, not even by a half step. Some unknown force was confining him to this place. The snow kept stuttering and falling. And it seemed that this winter has already gone on too long. Seven days. Later, the raucous sound of hooves approached from afar. The lost soul shifted from the noise and saw a group of Yulin royal guards do at the source. Search the area. A young general dressed in all black dismounted and motioned to the rest of the group with his hand, his face a mask of cold elegance. The guards dispersed, searching around the area, finally, easily overlooked and hidden at the base of the steps, they discovered the corpse. Dig, the general issues a single command, and thus, the lost soul, having watched over his body for the last seven days, finally came face to face with the sight of his own remains, despite the fact that all the guards were decorated soldiers. And all have seen their fair share of death and carnage. They still couldn't help but wretch at the look of this one, but the lost soul didn't care about the way he looked. He hadn't cared when he was alive and minded even less now that he's dead. The carcass in the snow didn't smell of rot, thanks to the snowstorms in the last few days. It was blue and purple all over, naked, just skin and bones, with big and small scars layered on top of one another scattered all over. It seemed impossible to find a single piece of unmared skin on the body of the Two eyes, one was just an empty socket while the other was wide open, staring blindly ahead. Its nipples were gone. Replaced with a dark scar as if someone had seared it with a hot iron brand repeated. While the other was just a bloody hole, cut off. By a blade, a piece of intestine dangled out of its lower half, in itself a mess of rotting meat and stuck through by a length of wood stained brown with blood. The two thighs had rotted away leaving only stark white bones that, on a closer look, were broken all over. The spirit felt a little proud of himself all of a sudden. Even in this state, he was able to braid the snow from sunrise to sunset before uttering his last breath. One of the men approached the body, wrapped in a black fox fur. Cape, my lord, the young general stepped forward to, a bit of warmth finally coming through in his otherwise indifferent voice, revealing a shred of anxiety. The man in the cape stood tall with a handsome face, aloof, he held a natural sense of extravagant majesty that couldn't conceal his exhaustion. His eyes lingered on the corpse, unrelenting. My lord, the young general reached out and pulled at him. You've seen what you came to see. Let's just go. The sound of a plea. The man didn't. Move, instead, he stooped down and moves to touch the gnarled hand of the corpse. The bones were all broken and the only thing holding the wrist together was a thin layer of skin on it. There were scars of a manacle that had been affixed for many years. The fingernails were all gone. An iron stud had been pushed through the left thumb, all the way through to the palm. The man shifted his gaze to the corpse's feet. They'd been hobbled years ago, the bones fractured, only four toes remained out. Of the ten, deformed and strange, with the nails pulled out as well. The spirit didn't understand the reason for the concern that the man showed to this rotting carcass. He didn't understand how this man could touch it with such a careful hand. Almost cautious, as if for fear of hurting it somehow, away, the man murmured quietly. The spirit burst into a peal of laughter, 
pity that no living being could hear the laughter of the dead. This was his name while he was still alive, one that no one had used for him for many years. They only called him whore, slave, pig, bitch, for so long that he'd almost forgotten that he was a person and that he had a name, Long Xuan. The spirit felt this was some kind of God-given joke. It's a wonder you still remember this name. He laughed to the point of tears. But spirits no longer had any tears to shed. My lord, the general crouched down too. He still hasn't spared the corpse a single glance. His worried eyes were only trained on. The man in front of him, Lo Wei, the man called out softly as he put his hand over the corpse's open right eye, wanting to somehow help it close and bring his soul to rest. But no matter how hard he tried, the eye remained open, staring ahead. A blast of wind swirled over the fallen snow and swept over the group. The storm started once more. The spirit felt himself drifting with the wind. The power that had kept him bound to the body dissipated. And he seemed to finally be free. He resolved to let the wind carry him to wherever it may blow. He was a sinner, a criminal. There's no place of eternal rest for him. And thus he must wander as a lost soul, your imperial majesty. The blizzard squalled, dimming everyone's vision with a haze of snow. The general grew more troubled. If your imperial majesty pities him, I'll send an order for him to be buried. Zijo three. he's dead said Emperor Long Zhuan. The head of the empire of Zhou Three Four, to his most valued grand general, Ning Fei. Your majesty, the general was determined to pull the emperor back up. Just then, a young man in white rushed through the guards without paying them any mind. He barreled through the retinue on his horse, stopping right in front of the remains. Grand Prince Yu Five, the young general moved to hold the interloper back but found himself pushed aside. How could you have done this to him? After a single look at the corpse, Grand Prince Yu. Long Xian couldn't hold back anymore. He screamed at his older brother. How could you? Are you satisfied? I don't know, Six. The emperor answered. I don't know. Footnotes. One. Demons of legend. Original text says ox head and horse face. Which are the first two demons you meet after dying? They act as guides or sometimes captors for spirits to the underworld. To Yulin Royal Guards, Yulin literally means a forest of feathers. They're a specific group of royal guards. Of which there are many in the Imperial Palace. This note is too. Distinguish them from other royal guards in the future. 3. Zhou, the Zhou and Zijo's name and the Empire, Kingdom of Zhou are two different words. 3.A Zijou, historically. Chinese names have several parts. Ming refers to the name that a person is given right after birth. Zi refers to the name that a person is given after coming of age in an official context and when addressed by elders, one would use Ming. And in a personal context between people of similar standing, especially to be polite and to show deference, one would use Zi. In this case, Ning is the young general's surname, Fei is his Ming. And Zijo is his Z. For the emperor's full title as translated is Ping Zhang Emperor of Grand Zhou. Ping Zhang is the emperor's regnal title, roughly translated to declarer of peace. His name is Long Zhuan. 5. Grand Prince Yu. Yu is a title style meaning affluence or wealth. His title is Grand Prince, named Long Xiang. 6. I. The pronoun the emperor uses is Jin, which is a royal pronoun much like the royal we in English. Translator's notes. This novel is at the same time easier and harder to translate than the other one. The sentences are a lot shorter and repetitive in English, but easier to read in Chinese. There's a lot of titles and royal ranks, etc., etc. Grand Prince is not a real title that is used in China. The actual title is just Prince or King not ruling. But I'm trying to use this title to distinguish him from the actual sons of the emperor, of which there are many. I will try to put as many footnotes in as possible, where possible. Some shortcuts have been taken in translating people's names in order to make it easier to read. I can translate the actual name meanings if people are interested. Let me know in the comments. Luo Wei had a fucked up life before. 
And there's a few fucked up parts of this novel we're going to have to get through. But there's a lot more BL based than the other one, which is why I wanted to. Get start on it, please heed the trigger warnings. Chinese historical BL also has a penchant for young characters. I wonder if this is because the authors are often not much older than high school or college. Students, or if this is just a staple in historical fiction, again, as with the other novel, I'm new to translation and have parts where I'm not sure. I'm trying to get the language to sound natural in English as much as I can. And may take a little liberty here or there in order to get the feeling across. Us, us, us. Rebirth, Degenerate Slave Abuses Tyrant, Chapter 2. Luo Wei opened his eyes again and found himself hurting all over, strained. How could a dead man still feel pain? Just as he pondered the question. A hand reached out and met his forehead. He glanced up to see the owner of the hand and startled in surprise. It was his father's hand. His father who passed away years ago. Are you finally awake? A handsome young man with tanned skin stuck his head out to peer at him, looking impatient. Serves you right. It was his second eldest brother. Loe started trembled like a leaf. His brother had been killed due to his impudence. How could he still be alive? Is it hurting bad? Noticing his son's bizarre behavior, Lo ZQ turned. To summon the doctor who was waiting aside, the white-haired doctor shifted closer to take Lo Wei's pulse, his face a picture of concentration. I. Lo Wei was doing his best not to not break down, his voice shook. Where am I? You're at home. Where else? Wozi couldn't hide his anger when it came to his younger brother. He couldn't even pretend to be happy as he spoke. Lo Wei scanned his surroundings. He remembered this room. This was his old room back at home. Every corner of it was filled with such luxury and opulence, revealing just how shallow and worldly he used to be. What are you scheming? Wozi asked rather unkindly. But I died, Wo Wei said. More to himself than anyone else, you died, Wozi became even angrier. Then what the hell are we supposed to be, ghosts? Wo Wei's vision went dark again. What's happening to him? Luzi questioned the doctor. Finally nervous as he watched his little brother pass out again, the doctor sighed. Senior Chancellor, he? Address Lo ZQ instead, the young master has suffered internal injuries. It won't be an easy recovery. This time around, it took Wo Wei two days to open his eyes again, when he did. The ones watching over him at his bedside were his two. Little attendants, Sha Shai and Cheesy. Wo Wei remembered that they had been killed as well, watching them, he realized that he was never kind to them, or rather. As the son of the senior chancellor, Wo Wei had never been kind to anyone. What happened to me? Wo Wei asked. Cha Xiao replied, you were injured, sir. Wo Wei lifted his hands and looked them over. Both were perfect and unscathed. But where am I? He asked once more. Chi Zi answered this time, young master. You're at home. Neither dared to utter an extra word in front of Luo Wei. He was notoriously easy to anger, and one wrong phrase could earn them a beating. They both feared him. Luo Wei remained dumbfounded for a moment. Then, all of a sudden he asked, What year is? It Sha Sha and Cheesy glanced at each other. Sha Sha replied, Young master, it's the fifth year of King Yuan One, the fifth year of King Yuan, the fifth year of King Yuan. Luo Wei moved too abruptly as he tried to get up, and the pain at the deep in his chest forced him to settle back into the bed. He was 13 during the fifth year of King Yuan, still the third son of the senior chancellor, and a member of the Luo family. It would still be seven years before his entire family would be wiped out. Fifth year of King Yuan, Luo Wei's voice wavered. That's right, sir, Cheesy couldn't begin to guess at what was wrong with their young master. Luo Wei stared ahead blankly without saying anything. The two little attendants waited. But no word came from their young master, sir. Finally, Xia Xia couldn't help but call out to him. Luo Wei covered his face with both of his hands. But he wasn't able to stop the tears from seeping through the cracks of his fingers. Young. Master, Qi Zi, who was usually so calm and collected, couldn't help but feel uneasy at this sight.
Their young master never cried, what's going on? Wo Wei's tears fell silently. He had thought that everything had already met its final end, but he couldn't fathom that the heavens would give him another chance. Is this an opportunity to rectify all of his past mistakes? Young master, are you in a lot of pain? Cheesy asked again, worried. Lo Wei wiped the tears off his face and smiled at his. To attendants, I'm fine. Would you please go fetch me something to eat? Sha Sha and Cheesy were stunned. When did their young master ever smile at them like this, please? Lo Wei said gently. With a touch of remorse, the two young attendants both rushed out at once. How strange their young master seemed ever since he woke up. It was as if he's become a whole different person. Footnotes 1. King Yuan era dates in historical China has two parts, a year number and an era title, usually linked to the emperor ascending the throne. It's currently year 5 in the King Yuan era. There's a historical King Yuan era, however. This story does not appear to have any real historical grounding and though the format is being used, the name King Yuan is not referring to any specific point in time. Translator's notes, this chapter is short and sweet, setting up the family. In Chinese, Luo Wei's father's title, Senior Chancellor, is rendered as the left chancellor. I did some research recently and found that this is the senior position to the other right chancellor. I think it makes sense to refer to them by seniority as not to confuse with positional words. I wonder if they stand on the left and right of the emperor during court assembly. Rebirth, degenerate slave abuses tyrant. Chapter 3, Lu Wei forced himself to sit up. His shoulders were in agony, but the pain was nothing to him, who had endured 10 years of torture from others. Lu Wei remembered how when he was 13, he was sought out for revenge by the two sons of the Feng Wu Wan Grand General, the two gave him a rough beating. As he tried to escape, the younger of the two, Zhao Zhanyi, shot an arrow through his left shoulder as well. He doesn't blame the Zhao brothers. It was his own fault for tormenting others. It was he, Luo Wei, who harassed the brother-in-law of the elder Zhao brother on the street. The only reason it happened was because he liked the look of that poor scholar's fiancée. At 13, he'd already learned to rob innocent women off the streets. Luo Wei shook his head, self-deprecating. Why was he such a miscreant in his past life? Was it purely because he was born into a powerful family? His father was the senior chancellor. His eldest brother was the general in command at Yunguan II, second eldest the general of the capital city. His mother was the daughter of a well-known military family. All his uncles on his mother's side were generals themselves. And lastly but not least, his aunt on his father's side was the current empress, Luo Ziyi. Everyone said that half the power of the great Zhou Empire lay in the Luo family. And it was because of this power that his family had been destroyed seven years after. His aunt was removed from the throne, apparently ending her own life in the cold palace three. His father had been stripped of titles and died on the road to exile in Lingnan. His eldest brother died in battle. Bones trampled to mud by the mounted soldiers of Northern Yin Four. His second eldest brother faced death breaking into the palace to save their father and used himself in exchange for his crimes by being sent to battle in Northern Yan. Unfortunately, he was poisoned to death in his own tent by someone in the palace while on his way to the battle. Afterwards came the old emperor's thunderous rage, the eldest prince, born of his aunt, was deposed of his position as the crown prince. He was then confined to the imperial mausoleum in Jiuquan, along with his mother's other sons, third prince Long Heng, sixth prince Long Hao, and thus the Luo family's properties were confiscated and the lineage exterminated. You have to protect your two nephews. This was his mother's last wish. Luo Wei didn't want to keep digging through his memories, but the recollections rushed forth like water through a broken dam unable to be stopped. It wasn't until the very last moment that his mother told him that he, Luo Wei, was not officially of the Luo family. His mother was Luo Ziqiu's third sister, Luo Zijin, the one who passed away while still in full bloom. 
At age 16, his difficult birth had caused her death. No one knew who his birth father was, and those in the family only knew that. Their young mistress was kidnapped for three months when she was 15. The pregnancy was discovered not long after she returned. And even on her deathbed, she would not name the man who forced this upon her. Lo Wei found out. Then, at the moment of his false mother's death, that he was a bastard whose origins no one had known, when the new crown prince, Long Juan, saved him, it was because everyone knew Lo Wei loved him. That Luo Wei was Long Zhuan's dog, and at that time, Luo Wei thought that. No matter what, Long Zhuan still had some feelings for him, and that his betrayal of his entire family was not in vain, but he didn't know that Long Zhuan saved him only to keep him alive. So that he could live a fate worse than death, a year later, Wu, Xing Emperor died due to sickness, and the crown prince Long Zhuan succeeded him, his was named the Pingjiang Emperor. It was at this time that Luo Wei, who'd been imprisoned with his two nephews for an entire year, finally saw Long Zhuan again. He was initially full of hope, but didn't imagine that Long Zhuan would immediately accuse him of betraying his family and ancestors, ordering all those present to list out his crimes. He was imprisoned in the palace that very day, for a total of three, Months, the guards in the palace all got their chance to have a piece of the previous young master of the Luo family. Luo Wei wanted to die. But Long Zhuan held the lives of his two nephews in his hands. So Luo Wei could only endure the humiliation. Three months later, without a single piece of unmarried skin on his body and his lower half wasted to the point that he couldn't walk any longer. Luo Wei was gifted to the army as a sex slave for the soldiers to let their steam out on, too. Years passed. That Long Zhuan held a memorial for the Luo family, and as the one who betrayed his ancestors, Luo Wei was paraded nude on the streets upon a wooden horse for three days. Further, after he was given to a brothel, suffering for another eight years, Luo Wei originally thought he'd be able to trade his shame for the lives of his two nephews but it never occurred to him that towards the end of his life, he'd hear that his nephews had died four years before in a fire at the old Uwo family ruins. It was then that he realized his life was just a joke, without a single shred of meaning. At the very end, he was discarded by the brothel at the temple ruins, died in the snowy wilderness. His corpse exposed to the elements for seven days. This was his final ending. Footnotes. 1. Feng Wu a title, much like a regnal name for the emperor, words were appended onto titles to signify the greatness of the receiver. 2. Yan Guan, a border fort between Great Zhou and Northern Yan. 3. Cold Palace, one of the many palaces in the Forbidden Palace. It's reserved for concubines that have fallen out of favor with the emperor, to live isolated and often without servants or appropriate amounts of rations. 4. Northern Yan, a state during the 16 Kingdoms era of China, however, as before, the author isn't big on making things historically accurate. This Northern Yan is purely fiction. Translator's notes. Well, that was a lot. I wonder if I should put content warnings at the beginnings of chapters or if this is par for course in Chinese BL translations. I haven't read a lot of translated ones, but out of all the ones I read in Chinese, this one was probably the most sadistic to the protagonist. Also some fat shaming in the next few chapters because Wu Wei was a pudgy little guy when he was a shithead. I'm not sure if the author meant it to be read that way, but knowing how people who are overweight are portrayed in society. It wouldn't surprise me. I hope those who are reading won't take it too hard and will tread around it lightly. Rebirth, Degenerate Slave Abuses Tyrant Chapter 4 Wu Wei has no complaints about those ten years of suffering. A miscreant like him deserved it. Everyone in the world had the right to humiliate him. The only exception was Long Zhuan. Wu Wei held no feelings for anyone in the world, but he was true to Long Zhuan. For Long Zhuan, Wu Wei helped to cause strain on the emperor and the empress relationship. He let Long Zhuan plot with the crown prince of Northern Yan, leading to his eldest brother. Not even having a body to be buried, 
and he helped pull off the great plot for the Luo family's downfall. Back then, he only had place in his heart for the second prince, Long Zhuan. Everything he did was for him. Long Zhuan wanted to be emperor, so he helped him become emperor by getting rid of every obstacle in his path, even if they were Luo Wei's own family, for all the awful things he did. All he got in exchange was a single sentence, since you like men. Why don't you service them from now on? Young master, Xiao Xiao had been standing by his bed for a while now, but all he saw was Wu Wei sitting there staring blankly into space, with no reaction at all. The bowl of kanji was nearly cold by this point, so he couldn't resist drumming up. His courage and opened his mouth to address Wu Wei. Xiao Xiao's voice brought him out of his reveries. Wu Wei plodded through the kanji, still silent. He caused the deaths of everyone in this estate and had no face to look at them again. His heart still moved at the thought of Long Zhuan. In the last life, it was an infatuation that held everything else in disregard. But in this life, all that's left was hatred. Since the heavens gave him another chance to start over, then his only goal in this new life was to protect his family. A sinner like him didn't deserve to get anything else. But his family, these people who treated him like one of their own despite knowing that he was a bastard. They deserved a lifetime of happiness and safety. Someone pushed open the door again. The senior chancellor's wife, Bo Hua, walked in, mother. Wu Wei called, his voice suddenly dry. I heard you were awake. Does it still hurt? Bo Hua asked him. Expressionless, it's all good, Wu Wei replied. His mother was always like this to him. He used to purposefully make her angry for fun because he thought she only loved his brothers and was cold to him, but he won't do it now. He didn't have the privilege to receive love from an honorable woman. Like her, your father and your second brother has gone to court. Bo Wei spoke in a cold tone as she regarded him. She had raised this child by her own hand, but she could never feel a closeness to him. Even now, as a 13-year-old, the senior, Chancellor's wife couldn't understand why Wu Zijin was determined to have him all those years ago. I see, Wu Wei avoided her gaze, answering quietly, The doctor will come to see you soon. Bo Hua thought that he was going to give her trouble, but didn't anticipate that he'd actually be well behaved today. For a moment, she didn't know what to say, so she left it at that and walked out. Wu Wei had drifted between sleep and unconsciousness for about a half month and then recuperated in bed for another. Luo Ziqiu and Luo Zi came to see him very little and only sat for a bit before leaving each time. They had nothing in common or to say to Wu Wei. Bo Hua came in frequently as well and the Wu Zi's wife, Ziyu Mao, never came by it. Oh, Luo Wei didn't mind it at all. Ziyu Mao came from a poor family. Luo Zi had once been injured in battle and she, a hunter's daughter, had rescued him. The two fell in love and married. This was a happy story, but Wu Wei didn't think so in. His past life, he looked down on his sister-in-law's hunter background and only had mean things to say about her at home, never giving her the time of day. The fact that she didn't come to visit was only natural. Translator's note, no footnotes, I. Think we've gotten enough background previously for this chapter to not have any footnotes, but let's see what happens once we get into talking about the palace and all that. Going to be doing another chapter tonight, I think. Rebirth, Degenerate Slave Abuses Tyrant, Chapter 5. During Luo Wei's recovery, Long Zhuan had ordered someone to come visit him, bringing more than a few gifts and a few words. Saying that he despised Peng Wu General's entire family. To this, Luo Wei only smiled. Long Zhuan did this too in the past life, and for these words, Luo Wei, his loyal dog, had come out biting. He'd sunk his teeth into the Zhao brothers, who'd injured him, and eventually lead to their exile from the capital. Feng Wu, General Zhao He Nian, had been good friends with the senior chancellor for many years. But because of this, they'd cut ties with each other. Originally the leading asset behind the crown prince. The general became a loyal supporter of the second. 
Prince Long Zhuan. The second prince was only 15 at this point, but he'd already started plotting for his future in front of Lo Wei. And eunuch one stood respectfully with his hands at his sides. He's one of Long Zhuan's close. Servants, Fu Yun, who'd become the overseer of all eunuchs in the back palace to once Long Zhuan ascended to the throne. And it was this one, along with a few other experienced eunuchs. That taught him how to submit under others, at that time, no matter how he'd will. And cry for help, overseer Fu never gave him even a chance to breathe. He only drugged him, administered cleansing for his bowels, and inserted larger and larger phalluses into him. I know. Lowe wanted to throw up, but forced himself to keep it. Down as he spoke dryly to Fu Yun, be sure to thank his highness for me when you get back. Yes, this servant understands. Fu Yun answered hurriedly. This is a reward for you. Lowe took a few silver coins and handed it to Fu Yun. Fu Yun. Paused. This was the first time that the young master Luo had given him a reward. Luo Wei put on a smile. Thank you for going through all the trouble, he said to the eunuch. The experiences of his past life made him understand that even small, characters like this couldn't bear to be offended. This servant thanks the young master. Fu Yan accepted the reward with a grin and didn't notice the ruthlessness that crossed Luo Wei's eyes momentarily. After Fi Yun departed, Cheesy asked Luo Wei, Young master, where should I put the gifts? Luo Wei lifted his gaze at the gifts from Long Zhuan. They were all novel and exquisite playthings. And Luo Wei had indeed loved things like these in his past life, put them in the storeroom. Luo Wei ordered Cheesy. He didn't pay attention to the gifts any more than that. Cheesy felt an extra layer of suspicion and shock. Previously, his master had treasured anything that came from the second prince and wouldn't let anyone else touch it. Yet, today, he didn't even bother giving it a second glance before ordering them to be put in storage. In the future, if the second prince sends someone else, Luo Wei said to Cheesy after some thought, Tell them that I'm not feeling well and I am resting. Don't bring them to see me. Give them a reward and tell them to go. Understood, Cheesy replied. He wished that his master could be as far from the second prince as possible. The Luo family supported the crown prince, after all, and were enemies. With the second prince, son of the noble consort Three Liu, as Cheesy left for the storeroom, he took another look at Luo Wei as the young master read in the gallery under the sunshine. Could it be that his master had visited death's door and turned over? A new leaf, Luo Wei's recuperation took a month, and the doctor finally said that he could stop taking medicine. At dawn a month later, Luo Wei was still dreaming when he was pushed awake by Xia Xiao. What's going on? Without losing his temper, Luo Wei asked sleepily. Xia Xiao breathed a sigh of relief. He'd been prepared to get a good thrashing. Young master, you need to get ready quick. The senior chancellor has sent down an order. You're being called to the palace. When she heard that, the emperor had called Luo Wei to the palace. Bo Hua, who'd not visited in many days, came to see Luo Wei. You mustn't talk nonsense when you enter the palace. She made a point to remind him. Yes, I understand. Luo Wei could only be respectful to her. Bo Hua stared at Luo Wei, a little dazed. He used to be pudgy with all the chub piled on his face, but since the injury, He'd gotten thin, very thin. What's the matter, mother? Luo Wei asked her. No, nothing. Bo Hua replied but didn't turn. Her gaze from him, she finally figured it out. Luo Wei actually looked a lot like his mother, Luo Zijin. Then I'll be on my way. Luo Wei respectfully excused himself. He didn't bother to dwell on the reasons behind her stare, knowing that she would never do him harm. Footnotes. One eunuchs, eunuchs were the preferred type of guard servant for the concubines of the back palace due to castration. They fill a variety of roles as such. Servant and eunuch will be used interchangeably for pacing, tea back palace, the imperial harem. The transliteration back palace is used here because harem often denotes purely a place where the concubines live, whereas the back palace behind the official palace where the emperor holds court. 
is for concubines as well as some of their younger sons, it's also harder to denote a difference between different parts of the harem palace without naming them specifically. 3. Noble consort The noble consort belongs to a rank of concubines, referred to as madams, and are second in importance in the harem to the empress. Translator's notes, one with a little bit of roughness. We will see Long Zhuan as a teenager in the next chapter. Are you excited? I'm still not 100% on some of the translations such as the back palace. Maybe I will make changes if it bothers me enough, but right now it feels easier than trying to work around the mental challenges of the word harem. Word harem.